So I want to start this morning with another trick question. Okay, everybody seemed to enjoy last week's trick questions about baptism so much. I thought we might start this week with another question that might seem a little tricky to begin with. Here we go. Probably won't throw any of you off, but here it is. Yes or no? Is Jesus a prophet? How does that strike you? My initial gut reaction is to say no. Because saying that Jesus is a prophet kind of feels like a downgrade from some of the things we've been reading about Jesus in the Gospel of John, especially most recently in chapter 5. No, Jesus isn't a prophet. He's the Son of God and God the Son. Is that your gut reaction too? Some of you are saying, no, Pastor Matt, you don't fool me here at all. That question doesn't say, is Jesus only a prophet? Right? That would be a simpler one to answer, right? Jesus is not just a prophet, but he is a true prophet of God, is he not? Well, what is a prophet? A prophet is a divinely authorized spokesman for God. A prophet is a person supernaturally gifted with actual words from God to speak to other people. Sometimes, not always, the prophet even tells the future with those words. A prophet is a divinely authorized, from God, spokesman for God. A from God, supernatural spokesman for God. Now, given that definition, is Jesus a prophet? Let me ask this question. Is Jesus the prophet? If you remember, just a few weeks ago, or months ago now, in John chapter 1, the Jewish religious authorities were investigating John the Baptist and asked John who he thought he was. And John said that he was not the Christ. Remember this? John chapter 1. He was not the Christ, not the Messiah. And so they said, okay, well, who are you then? Are you Elijah? What did he say to that one? He said he's not. And then they asked him, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. That's John chapter 1, verse 21. What were they talking about? The prophet. Well, that's what our passage is about today. In Deuteronomy 18, there is the promise of a prophet. I almost titled this message, The Prophet's Prophecy About a Prophet to Prophesy. But I thought that might be a bit much. But that's what it is. What you have before you, if you have Deuteronomy 18 laying on your lap, is an ancient passage of Holy Scripture that promises that God will raise up a prophet to speak for him to his people. And here's how ancient it is. It was written more than 3,000 years ago. Today we're going back more than 3,000 years on the calendar. More like, it's actually more, more like 3,500 years, going towards 4,000 years to the book of Deuteronomy. Most of Deuteronomy was written in Hebrew by Moses to give instruction to the second generation of Israelites who were actually going to get to enter the promised land. Moses is getting them ready. He's getting the people ready for what they were going to experience in Canaan. And getting them ready, he was, he was telling them how God expected them to live as his people when they got there. By the way, you can thank Heather Joy for this sermon being so short and focused today. After church, everybody thank her for this. She loves it when, when you do that. I've been thinking so much about what Jesus said at the end of chapter 5 of John when he said, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. I've been thinking about that all the time. And I was going to do this whole sermon this morning. What did Moses write about Jesus? And I was going to do everything Moses said about Jesus in Genesis and everything that Moses said about Jesus in Exodus and everything Moses said about Jesus in Leviticus and everything. You get the idea, right? And Heather was on one of our walks. Heather says, you're going to try to preach the entire Torah in one message. Don't you think that's a bit much? And I'm like, oh. Yeah, right. I should probably just focus on one thing. This is the one thing I landed on. 
I've never gotten to preach through Deuteronomy in the last 25 years. So here's a chance to study it some together. Before Moses gives the promise of the prophet, he warns the people to not become like the pagan nations currently living in the promised land, especially in how they try to predict and control the future. Let's start in verse 9. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or cast spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination, but as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. We'll stop there for a second. Moses says that the people of Israel were going to be tempted to act like the people of Canaan, especially in adopting these occult practices that Yahweh hated. He calls them here detestable or abominable. That means he hates them. He hates them for many reasons, but a big one is that they all encourage relying on powers other than him. And Moses gives a long list of these. In fact, this is the longest list of occult practices in the whole Bible. Moses says the Israelites are to reject all of them. Sadly, all of these are still present in our world today. And sadly, it must be said that they should be roundly rejected today by followers of Jesus. These are not the ways to know the future or to shape the future or to make our decisions. And those that practice them are playing with infernal fire. This is serious stuff. Don't play with it. I know it's popular and it might seem harmless and fun. It might even work sometimes because of powers behind it. But it's rebellion against the true God. Moses says it's one of the reasons why the Canaanites are going to be judged and dispossessed and driven out of the promised land. Israel should not then do the same things they did. And they don't need to do any of that cruel and crazy stuff. Because God is going to give them a prophet. Now look at verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. So there's the promise of a prophet. God has promised a a divine spokesman from God to God's people. From God to God's people. And that is good news in so many ways. For one, just that God loves to communicate. God's a talking God. A speaking God. You know, he could be glorious and never say anything to us, never tell us about himself, but he doesn't leave his people in the dark. And we know that Moses is going to die. I mean, he's really getting up there. I think he's like 120 by the end of the book of Deuteronomy when he dies, right? He can't go on forever. The words from God, however, were not going to stop with Moses. God has promised to send a prophet. Let's look and see what this promised prophet is going to be like. For starters, he'll be a gift. Look at verse 15 again. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. That for you means that God will give this prophet to his people as a gift. He'll be aimed at God's people. He'll be, it says, for them. They aren't going to be left alone. They're not going to have to wonder what God is like or what God wants. He'll raise up a prophet for them and from them. That is to say, this prophet will be an Israelite. Moses says, from your own brothers. He won't be a foreigner. He won't even be an angel. He'll be a human being, an Israelite human brother for his people, from his people, and like 
who? What does it say? Like what? Like Moses. Yeah. Like Moses. That's in verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. So here, Moses is the model, okay? Moses is the prototype, the prototype prophet. He's been doing this prophet thing already. So they'll be able to recognize the fulfillment of this promise because they've already seen something like it. Now, in what way will this prophet come to be like Moses? Maybe a lot of different ways. Moses lived a pretty amazing life. Just read the books of Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I won't preach them all to you this morning, though I'm sorely tempted. Here's one thing Moses did. He mediated a covenant between God and his people. He interceded. That's where Moses goes with this in verse 16. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord nor see this great fire anymore or we will die. Do you remember that part? When they encountered God at Mount Horeb, which is Mount Sinai. When they went to the mountain on fire and they were scared almost to death at his glorious holiness. And they they asked for a mediator. Don't speak to us. Send somebody to speak in between. And God gave them Moses. He allowed Moses to be a a go-between between God and his people. Moses now says that this prophet will be a kind of go-between like that for them. They will hear from God through the prophet. But it will not be the prophet's words. It will be God's own words they hear. That's verse 17. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. God has promised to give to his people a prophet who has his very own true divine words placed directly in the prophet's mouth to speak. That could be a painful thing. Remember a year ago how the prophet Jeremiah talked about his experience of that, that he said it was like a fire in his mouth? It burns. He's got to speak it. And some of the things he says, he doesn't even want to say, but it's what needs said. And the people were supposed to listen because these words were the very words of God. And God was going to back them up. Moses warns in verses 20 through 22 that some false prophets were going to pretend to be true prophets and pretend to speak in his name. And they were not only to be rejected, but under the old covenant, they were to be executed. That's how serious it was. To say, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord had not thus said it. Look at verse 20. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? Well, here's one way, verse 22 If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Last year, right about this time of year, we met a prophet named Hananiah in the book of Jeremiah. Anybody remember Hananiah from, uh, I think it's chapter 28 of Jeremiah. Hananiah broke that wooden yoke that Jeremiah was supposed to wear on his neck. Remember, he had to go around with that wooden yoke on his neck, and Hananiah grabbed it, and he broke it. And then then he said, in two years, God is going to restore Judah and bring the exiles back and put the king back on the throne and break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Remember that? What a dramatic moment. It was exciting, it was encouraging, and it was exactly what everybody wanted to hear. And it was false. It was, it was as false as two plus two is minus two. And within the year, Hananiah was dead. Beware of listening to people who only tell you what you want to hear. 
The true prophet from God tells you what God says, whether you want to hear it or not, with God's own true words in his mouth. And what he says comes to pass. It's not just wishful thinking. It's God's word. So who is this prophet who was promised? I think it was Joshua. And I think it was Samuel. And I think it was Nathan. And I think it was Isaiah. And I think it was Jeremiah. And I think it was Daniel. And I think it was Ezekiel. And I think it was Zechariah. That's a crazy book, by the way. I read Zechariah this week. Woo! I think it was Micah. I think it was Malachi. Remind me to preach on Malachi next Advent season, okay? That's the late great Italian prophet Malachi, right? I think that Deuteronomy 18 applies to a long line of faithful prophets whom God graciously gave to his people, from his people. Mediatorially speaking, God's own true words that God himself placed in their mouths. But I also think this is a passage for Advent. I think that not one of those prophets could ever fully fill up the promise of this prophet. I mean, a prophet like Moses? That's a high level to attain in the history of Israel. The book of Deuteronomy ends in chapter 4 by saying, quote, No prophet has risen in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. Nobody has reached his stature as a prophet, a divine from God spokesman for God, whom the Lord knew face to face. Somebody who could mediate a whole new covenant. And the Jews thought that nobody had ever reached this level either. Year after year, they kept reading Deuteronomy. They look at the prophets. All the various prophets. And they'd say, he's good, but is he Deuteronomy 18? They believed that God was going to one day send a prophet who would fill up Deuteronomy 18 like nobody ever had. That's why they asked John the Baptist, are you the prophet? Are you the promised prophet of Deuteronomy 18? And John said, no, he's not. So who do you think it is? Yeah. Was there a prophet who was spared from death in infancy, like Moses was? Was there a prophet who taught on a mountainside and gave a new law there, like Moses did? Was there a prophet who brought a whole new covenant, mediated for God's people, like Moses did? Was there a prophet who was faithful in all of God's house and even over God's own house, to use the language of Hebrews chapter 4? Was there ever a prophet like Moses, or even greater than Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face? Who fits that bill? Who's like the prototype and is even better? Who was a prophet for his people, from his people? What's that sound like? To me, that sounds like John chapter 1. It sounds like what the Clarks read to us this morning. He came to that which was his own. Like Moses, a second Moses, a mediator with God's own true words in his mouth. What he says comes true. So if he would say something like he was going to die and then he was going to take his life back up again, then that's exactly what must happen. Who does that sound like to you? think it sounds like Jesus. He is not just a prophet. He's the prophet. And everything he says is true. John says that he is full of grace and truth. Jesus himself says that he is the truth. His mouth is full of the very words of God because he is the very word of God. We said it this morning in the In our statement, we said he is our prophet, priest, and king. 
So I've only got one point of application this morning for today, but it's a big one. It's kind of everything. How should we live if Jesus is the prophet par excellence? What did verse 15 say? You must listen to him. You must listen to him. In verse 19, God says, If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. There will be consequences if God's prophet is ignored, and they will be dire. Verse 22 said that if a prophet was false, then do not be afraid of him. So I think the opposite is also implied. If the prophet is true, then you should have a holy fear of him and of everything he says. You must listen to him. Listen to the prophet Jesus. That's what God said at the Mount of Transfiguration, is it not? Where Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And who appeared there with him? Moses and Elijah. Those are two power prophets right there. And then there's this voice from heaven saying, This is my son whom I love. Sound familiar? Like his baptism, last, like we studied last Sunday? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then what did God say? Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Are you doing that? Are you listening to Jesus in all of your life? That obviously means obeying him. But it means much more than that. Are you listening to what Jesus says about himself? That's what we've been doing as we're studying the Gospel of John. We're going to hear seven major things that Jesus says about himself as we go along. The seven I am's. He's already said some mind-blowing things about himself already. Are you listening? Are you listening to what Jesus says, not just about himself, but about his Father? John says, no one has ever seen God, the Father, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side. If there's anything like face-to-face, it's that. God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. He's prophesied about him. He's spoken true words about who the Father is. If that's not a true prophecy, I don't know what is. Do you want to know what God is like? God wants you to know what God is like. That's why he sent his son. You must listen to him. Listen to what he says about himself. Listen to what he says about God the Father. Listen to what he says about God the Spirit. Don't wait until we get to chapter 14. Jump over there and read it for yourself. He says in chapter 14, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. That's a prophecy. Listen to the prophet Jesus. Listen to what the prophet Jesus says about you. What's he say about you? Same chapter, chapter 14, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. How's that for a prophecy? Listen to the prophet Jesus. Are you listening to him? I must confess that I have let my heart be troubled recently. I've been struggling with this one. I've I've listened to the world, the flesh, and the devil, and they all want to tear me down. And I've listened to all of my fears. I've listened to my own internal prophecies about how my life is going to work out. 
That's called worrying, by the way, in case you didn't recognize the term. Did you know that worrying is prophesying? It's believing in your own bad prophecies. I'm a terrible prophet. But for some reason, I keep coming back to listen to myself when I need to listen to Jesus. This is the prophet Jesus. This is my favorite passage of Scripture, John 16, 33. The prophet Jesus is speaking. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. There's a prophecy. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Listen to the prophet Jesus. The second Moses has come and he is much greater than the first one. Listen to what the prophet Jesus says about salvation. Back to John 5. This is really just another sermon on John 5. Another way I could fit one in. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word, my prophecy, and believes him who sent me, who put the words in my mouth, whoever believes that has eternal life and will not be condemned. He is crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth. A time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Listen to Jesus. You must listen to him and have life in his name. Are you listening?